Yeah, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, Philemon chapter 1, verse 12, where Paul, yes, say. Oh, sorry, Pastor. Um, yeah, I was going to ask a question just before we left the class. And sorry to draw you back, but I just have two questions. Um, the verse 6 we read about um, the word koinonia. So, um, Based on what you said, I went through different translations. It seems like there is um, there's a like there's a difference uh, disparity in communication of what that verse means. So I don't know if maybe you've had the opportunity to just check all the verse all the versions to see that to see if there if all the versions are aligned because it seems like the KJV says something different from the NKJV. The CJB says something completely different from KJV and NKJV. So I'm, I'm not really sure exactly. So what does sharing the, of your faith say in these uh, different versions? Also, so so it, they sometimes use sharing, they sometimes use partnership, which is fine. But it's the latter part of the verse that some say acknowledge, some say deepen your understanding. Like it's just different things said. So I'm not sure exactly which was the right translation of that verse. Yeah. Um, so I said that uh, the verse uh, six, sharing of your faith. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, I said that verse six, sharing of your faith, is one verse which is was very difficult to translate and uh, commentary writers, theologians uh, found it very difficult to bring about the right interpretation or the right possible meaning of this phrase, sharing of your faith. And so much has been written just about uh, uh, verse 6. Uh, and this phrase, sharing of your faith, is very difficult to explain because of the Greek word quinonia, which means sharing, fellowship, and partnership so the the scholars say that there could be three possible meanings uh firstly koinonia sharing in which means you know sharing in the christian faith so paul must basically be saying that you know he does a prayer that he has for philemon is that the faith that both Paul and uh, Philemon share will lead Philemon deeper and deeper into the Christian truth. Now, quinonia can also mean fellowship, which so he's there's some uh, scholars say could be interpreted that it could be Paul's prayer that the Christian fellowship that Philemon is part of uh, could lead Philemon even more deeper into the truth or the knowledge of uh, Jesus Christ. But the third, uh, you know, possible meaning is that uh, it could mean an act of sharing. So this, in that case, this verse could possibly mean that it's Paul's prayer that the way uh, Philemon generously shares all that he has with people could lead him more and more deeper into the knowledge of the good things which uh, lead to Christ Jesus. And so you know, uh, even as you struggle to find the right interpretation of my meaning for this phrase, sharing of your faith in verse 6, uh, many of them say the third uh, uh, meaning, that is, you know, could, the act of sharing could be the possibly, could be the correct uh, one that, you know, uh, uh, Philemon's generosity or his characteristic of sharing other, with others uh, could lead um, or his love towards people um, uh, because people felt rested and refreshed in his home could lead him deeper and deeper into the knowledge of the good things which lead to Christ. Okay. Uh, okay. You, you, you said it right. I, I was just, my, my concern is the latter part of the verse. Like the KJV says, um, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by acknowledging every good thing which is in which is in Christ Jesus. Um, the NKGV says um, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of your of every good thing which is 
in you in in you in Christ. But in other versions, we see it saying, just like you said rightly, him being led into a deeper understanding of every good thing. So this is where I, I, I'm struggling to, um, I'm, I'm struggling in understanding, like, what was Paul's, um, based on all the definitions of koinonia we looked at, what was exactly the outcome of what he was saying in general? Because it looks like all the versions are having different things. Like, I can acknowledgement is different from understanding, unless I'm, I'm maybe mixing it. The, the way I'm interpreting acknowledgement, I, I, I don't see it tallying with our understanding of deepening his understanding. Let me put it that way. Deepening his understanding and acknowledgement. It looks separate, or maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. Maybe you can help. So uh, it's basically that Paul's prayer for Philemon is that he desires that you know the sharing of his faith would become effective as you know Philemon understood the work God did in him. Uh, you know every good thing which is in you, which means that you know uh, Paul is praying for Philemon uh, that he desires that the sharing of his faith. You know, uh, and every good thing that he does would become effective, even as Philemon understood the work of the work God did in him, which is the every good thing which is in him. So, uh, so basically, you know, the very foundation of effective evangelism is that you know, um, uh, you know, our people's lives can be touched or changed by God you know, through the overflow of our own lives, the way we minister uh, to them. So God has done every good thing in the life of Philemon. Now, it was uh, something up to Philemon, uh, you know, it was it was a matter of it being acknowledged by both Philemon and those who shared in the faith with Philemon. So, you know, uh, you know, when he does these good things, um, others would acknowledge the faith that he has in Christ Jesus. Others would also acknowledge uh, his love that he has for Christ because the love that translates into his love for his fellow uh, believers. And um, when people see the good things that they do, you know, they would come to uh, Jesus Christ. The reason why uh, the sharing of the faith is not effective uh, is because, you know, sometimes we don't know, our uh, we can't communicate every good thing that God has uh, done for us. So it's important that, you know, even as uh, Paul, Paul is saying, that even as you continue to uh, you know, take care, refresh the hearts of saints, bless others. It is uh, what you're doing actually is you're acknowledging, you know, what Christ has, every good thing that Christ has done to you and that you are, uh, you know, showing it out to others and people who look at you, you know, are encouraged in their faith and also they are going to come to the knowledge of the truth, the salvation that is in Christ uh, Jesus. Uh, understood. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, my my second question is, um, based on what Paul wrote to um, Philemon about Onesimus going back, um, verse sixteen says, uh, "No longer as a slave, but better than a slave." I'm just wondering, could it be that Paul had a different perspective of slavery? when it came to the brotherhood in Christ. Like, because it seems to me here that Paul would rather not have anyone be a slave, but just serve, you know, as a worker or something. But Paul says no longer as a slave, but better than a slave. Maybe I'm over reading this, I, I don't know. But it seems like Paul has a different opinion now about slavery, uh, we, uh, I don't know. Yeah, actually, we had this question, I think, when we, uh, somebody uh, brought up this question and we were studying. I was, I was the one. That's why I'm bringing it up again. <laughs> 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 I guess, I, because that caught my attention. That's why I wanted to bring it up again. Because he's saying better than his sleep. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm still trying to reconcile all he's been saying. 
with this. So that that I was the one who brought that up. So that's why I brought this up again. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See. Uh, so we look there that uh, you know uh, Paul is not somebody who's trying to abolish uh, the whole thing about slave system or the slavery. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, you know, he writes about how slaves should relate to their masters, also how masters should look at their slaves because, you know, um, he didn't want to abolish the whole thing of slavery, but the whole idea of uh, slavery had a very new perspective in the sense that, you know, it's only at church that masters and slaves sat together and worshipped God, which was something that was something that was people could not even think of or comprehend or you know but that happened in church so some of the slaves who did come to um, uh, to Christ you know and became believers and Paul writes about them in Romans Timothy Titus and um, uh, so he's basically saying hey slaves you know now since you have your new identity in Christ how much better you need to s serve your masters who are also uh, uh, brothers and tries not take advantage because thinking that hey they are brothers they they can't tell me what to do they shouldn't be uh, you know uh, or I shouldn't be working hard for them they should understand you know when I want to read my bible or attend a prayer meeting or blah blah that you know I have not been able to do my chores or my work because of that but he's saying you know all the more that we need to um, uh, serve them because they are brothers in Christ so all the more we serve them because they're not just masters but uh, brothers in uh, Christ but here in um, verse 16 you know uh, when Paul says that uh, did we come to verse 16? Yeah, Where verse 16. yes sir no we've not yet reached verse 16 we are uh, just in verse uh, 12 oh, so sorry. when I I'm no problem Sorry. Yes. Sorry. So when we come to verse 16, can I explain, say, is that all right yeah. with you? That, that's yeah. fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Okay, so um, we were in verse 12 where Paul says, I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. So he's saying, I'm sending Onesimus back to his master because that is what is lawful of me to do. That is what Christ would require me to do. And he says, you know, I'm sending him back. Uh, you know, you, you therefore receive him that is my own heart. So, you know, yes, Onesimus has done something wrong. He ran away from his master and was time to set things right. So Paul was willing to send him back. Uh, yet, you know, uh, Paul obviously wanted Philemon to deal gently with Onesimus. Now, under the Roman law, a slave owner had complete ownership or total control over his slave. And it was, wasn't was unusual for slaves to be, you know, crucified uh, for, of, or, you know, for lesser offenses than escaping. Uh, so if they escaped, they could be crucified. And we know that Rome had around six, uh, 60 million slaves. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a constant fear in the hearts of masters that these slaves if they get together could revolt and you know it could be a big thing because there were 60 million of them so therefore uh, the laws against runaway slaves were very very stringent very very strict and so when they captured a runaway slave uh, you know uh, the slave could be crucified or could be branded with red hot iron on their forehead uh, with the letter f which stands for fugitive so, you know, uh, looking at all of these things, Paul is telling Philemon, you know, considering all that could be done to Onesimus because he's now a runaway slave who's coming back, you know, uh, he's saying, but understand this. And he writes this phrase saying, I'm sending my own heart. You know, that is my own heart. So Philemon, uh, basically, uh, Paul is saying, Philemon, I know this man has done you much wrong. Uh, he deserves to be punished. But even as I send him, consider him as my own heart, you know, uh, as if Paul is standing in front of you and just be merciful and kind to him, just like you would be merciful and kind uh, to me. So again, Paul here, when he says my own heart testifies of, you know, his genuine love for his new son in the faith, new son in Christ Jesus and looks at Onesimus, you know, as his uh, son. 
Verse 13, he says, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So clearly Paul wanted Onesimus uh, to stay back because he's a big help to him. Uh, but, you know, Paul uh, sweetens his uh, appeal in three ways. First, he says, if Onesimus, Onesimus stayed, you know, he could serve Paul on your behalf, which means Paul is basically saying or writing this way to Philemon. Philemon, if you leave Onesimus with me, it's like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightful servant. Secondly, if Onesimus stayed, he helped a man in chains. Uh, so Paul could be basically writing this way to Philemon saying, Philemon, I know Onesimus might be of some use to you, yet I am in chains and I need him all the more. I need him all the more because he can help me get what I want even as I am in chains. Thirdly, we could look at this whole verse in this way. If Onesimus, Onesimus stayed, he helped a man in chains for the gospel. So, you know, Paul could be basically writing this way to Philemon saying, Philemon, please don't forget why I am here in chains. Remember that it's for the sake of the gospel. So this whole, uh, you know, verse, verse 13, uh, could have this appeal in these three different ways. You know, Philemon, if you leave Onesimus with me, it's like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightly slave or servant. Philemon, I know the second way we can look at this is Philemon. I know Onesimus might be of some use to you, but yet I'm in chains and I need all the help I can get. Or the third possible way that we could look at this verse is, hey Philemon, you know, please don't forget why I am here in chains. Remember that it's for the sake of the gospel. Okay, so that is why Paul wanted to keep on SMS so we can look at his appeal in these three different uh, ways. Verse 14, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be of compulsion as it were, but voluntary. So Paul is basically writing now and saying, hey, you know why I don't want to use, exert my authority or, you know, order you or do it out of, uh, uh, you know, force or compulsion. Uh, but want to do it, make an appeal out of love and leave it to you to make a decision uh, uh, based on your consent, based on what you think is right. Because if you do something that is good, you know, in taking back on SMS, um, uh, forgiving him uh, as a brother in Christ, and also if you decide to send him back to me, then your good deeds, uh, you know, which you are going to do will not be done out of compulsion. Uh, but would be voluntary out of your own good nature because you have that love for the saints, for the believers. You're known for your good works, your good deeds, and that your reward will be great. So he's basically writing why now he does not use compulsion force because he wants Parliament to get basically the credit uh, to receive his reward because he's doing it out of his own consent and a voluntary. So Paul made this appeal and made it strong and skillfully, but at the same time, you know, he really did leave the decision to Philemon. Uh, he could appeal in love, uh, but you know, he could uh, where he could appeal in love, but he would not trample over uh, uh, the rights of a Philemon. So this is what explains his decision not to force him or demand from him. Uh, you know, then if he demands or forces him or uses authority, then Philemon's good, good deeds, whatever he decides, would be out of compulsion. Hey, I have to do this because Paul is my mentor. He led me to Christ and he's in authority. He's, I have to obey him, blah, blah. But if he does it voluntary, then, you know, um, uh, the Philemon would receive his reward. Uh, and also the whole affair would not be something unpleasant and uh, something that would not create a rift or a, 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 a division in their, bring strife in their relationship, but would just, uh, you know, uh, everything would just be as it is and, you know, would just work out uh, good. And also their relationship will not be sad or, you know, would not drift away. So we see how Paul uh, uses his wisdom, you know, how he uh, deals with people, how he, 
uh, does not make use of his the relationships, his authority, something that we can learn so beautifully uh, from Paul in this um, letter, even as you know, we are leaders or we go on to be leaders, how we need to treat people, how we can't demand from them, or force them, but uh, request them and leave it to them to make the decision and how we have no rights over people, their, um, their property or their life or their, 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 their family. Because sometimes as ministers of God or some people who are mentors, some people who we lead to Christ, we think that, you know, hey, I led you to Christ, so I have authority over your finances, over your family, your spouse, your children, what you say, what you do, where you go, uh, you know, what you buy. I mean, we have seen, uh, sadly, people uh, who manipulate others like this and uh, it's very, very sad, but we know that we don't use that authority because we've led them to Christ doesn't mean that we have authority over their lives. Christ has authority over their lives, not us. But we just, when we see things that need to be put in order into their lives, we just uh, tell them and leave the decision uh, for them to make, but we don't um, force ourselves upon them. Uh, we have no rights over them, only Christ has uh, the rights over them and we just do what the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us to do. Verse 15, uh, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him uh, forever. So, you know, uh, Onesimus running away made him a criminal and he could receive death penalty for this. Yet, uh, you know, Paul is saying, you know, I see God's purpose in this. And what is God's purpose? That, you know, he come to Rome, he meet me, you know, he's be saved. Um, uh, he knows the Lord Jesus as his personal savior. And also that, you know, he can now become of use, like his name is usefulness or purpose. He could be of greater use and purpose not only to you, Philemon, to me as well, and to the body of Christ, and to the work of Christ, the kingdom of God. So, you know, he sees a purpose in everything that God has done in Onesimus' life, um, you know, and he's saying once you see that purpose as well, uh, Philemon, you'll be able to receive Onesimus uh, forever again back into your uh, household. Now, verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Paul is now reintroducing Onesimus to Philemon, uh, not as a slave, but as a brother, uh, because he's talking here about not their um, job responsibilities, but their relationship of who they are in Christ Jesus, based on their relationship in Christ Jesus, uh, you know, uh, now Onesimus becomes a brother in Christ to Philemon and not as a slave. Uh, but, you know, Paul effectively uh, here, you know, abolished this master-slave uh, relationship and lays the foundation for, you know, uh, 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 for him to accept him back into his household, uh, basically, uh, as a believer in Christ Jesus. So, you know, um, yes, he might, uh, uh, you know, take him back as a slave, but, uh, you know, he can also take him back as a believer, as a brother in Christ, you know, who is in that position of um, uh, serving him uh, as a slave in his uh, household. So Onesimus is not like a slave, he is a slave, but he's no longer still a slave in the fullest sense uh, because he's more than a slave. He's now a brother in the Lord. So we see that, you know, Onesimus uh, did not like to be a slave, and that is why he ran away. But once he comes to his newfound identity in Christ, he knows who he, he is in Christ, but he also knows in reality that, yeah, his calling is to be a slave and he's willing to go back to that. Uh, to that um, identity of being a slave with a new found sense of identity and purpose that he has to serve his slave, his master, because that is what God has called him to do, purposed him to do. But now he goes back with a fresh sense of, clear sense of purpose 
and calling and also with the will of God. And the same way he's telling uh, Philemon, hey, Philemon, uh, he's uh, Onesimus is your slave, but uh, no, uh, uh, yes, he is your slave, but no longer still a slave in the fullest sense. Uh, he's also a brother in the Lord. So as a brother in the Lord, as you would receive a fellow brother in the Lord, because many of them would come and stay and be refreshed in Philemon's house, many uh, saints and believers would come and worship in his house. When you receive them as a brother in Christ, receive him. Uh, and why is he saying this? Because he's saying, pardon him. You know, he has offended you. He uh, stands with the criminal, but, you know, receive him as, um, uh, as a brother in the Lord. And he's willing to serve you as a slave. He's willing to be useful and purposeful, just as his name is uh, back as a slave. So, you know, he's here talking, he's um, spoken about Onesimus's new self-identity, going back as a slave uh, uh, in the new sense identity that he has. And also he's telling uh, Philemon, hey, as a master, you know, your responsibility is to look at him more as a brother in Christ and not just as a um, slave. So uh, we see that, you know, uh, Paul could have written him uh, and said, you know, don't take him as a slave now, take him as, uh, you know, don't uh, have any, you know, don't uh, get him into any uh, punishment because he's a brother and blah, blah. He doesn't tell him all of those things, but he just tells him, you know, he's no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. That means, yes, he is your slave, but more than a slave, he is your uh, uh, brother. So, you know, uh, he's sending him back because, yes, he belongs there. He's a slave. He belongs to Philemon. So he's not saying, hey, you know, uh, uh, we are trying to abolish these things here. But, you know, so you don't take him back as a slave. Take him as, you know, as a son or something like that. He doesn't tell him. But um, take him back, you know, because he's coming back to serve you. But look at him with that new sense of identity that Christ looks at. And also as how, you know, uh, Onesimus looks at his new um, identity. Yes, say, hey, did that help now? Okay. Yes, Pastor, it, it, it helped. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to verses uh, 17 to 22. Before that, anyone else has any questions? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to verses 17 to 22. Can one of you please read verses 17 to 22, please? Mangi, would you like to read? We haven't heard your voice in a long time. Uh, first, I don't have Bob with me at the moment. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay, go ahead, Sister Ravini. Thank you, ma'am. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand, I will repay that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So in verse 17 says, if then you count me as a partner, receive Onesimus as you would receive me. So partner in the sense of a fellow believer, as a brother in the Lord. Uh, if you look, Paul is basically saying, uh, Philemon, if you look on me as a man united to you in fellowship, then receive Onesimus in the like manner, in the same way you would receive me. So Paul actually asked Philemon to treat Onesimus as if he were Paul coming to him, standing uh, before him. Yes, say. Yes, Pastor. Sorry, I, I, I'm just bringing out an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, as we have agreed that these were letters not written in chapters and verses. 
And if we agree that this was a flow, then it might be that that verse six will tally more with partnership. Because we see here again, him saying, if you consider me as a partner, that means there's somewhere he's coming from. So maybe the verse six is more of partnership in terms of koinonia. Since he's saying, if you consider me, as a partner, again, I, I could just be wrong. I'm I just brought out the observation. Uh, I was just saying. Yeah, thank you, Say. Koinonia basically means, the Greek word koinonia used for sharing in verse six means sharing, fellowship, and participation. So it's not partnership, but it is participation, fellowship, and sharing. So uh, that is what the closest meaning is uh, the third one, which is said the act of sharing. So participating in other people's life in the act of sharing or, you know, sharing your resources and thus participating in their lives, which could be a closest meaning. So then in that sense, yes, part, participation is the closest meaning for koinonia. Oh, sorry. I, I mixed that up. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Pastor. No problem. Yeah. Thank you, Say. Okay, um, so here he says that, um, you know, um, okay, receive him back just as you would uh, receive me as if I was standing there. And verse 18, if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that uh, on my account. So, you know, when Onesimus ran away from Philemon, he actually even robbed him. Uh, you know, which itself is in a bigger capital crime, not only that he ran away, but also robbed his master. Uh, so Paul is saying that, you know, whatever he's taken from, stolen from you, put it in my account. I'm willing it to pay back to Philemon what Onesimus has stolen. And then he says that, you know, uh, Paul could afford to pay Onesimus's expenses uh, because there was a sense in which Philemon you know, also owed Paul his very life because the salvation that he's given, uh, you know, Paul, Paul is the one who led him to Christ. So Paul had been uh, the means of Philemon's conversion. So, you know, he was immeasurably uh, in debted to uh, the apostle Paul. So Paul not only gently reminds him of that fact as a reason that he should also deal uh, you know, kindly with Onesimus uh, for his sake. But he's saying he's not using that. He's just reminding him of that. But he's saying, hey, but I can also pay you back uh, what Onesimus has stolen uh, from you. And verse 20 says, um, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. So um, joy here is more literally the word profit. Uh, the ancient Greek word is oninimi, uh, which is the root word from which the word, the name Onesimus has, uh, you know, has been brought about. So the Greek word oninimi is, uh, is the root word for the name Onesimus. So again here, Paul is uh, playing on words, so to say, uh, and the name Onesimus uh, he is using it to play uh, with, you know, uh, or to communicate a request. He's saying, uh, let me have Onesimus back from you in the Lord. Okay, so he's basically saying, you know, um, the word joy, which means profit. So, uh, which is the Greek word oninimi, which comes, the, the, the name Onesimus comes. So he's basically using all of this sense you know, using that word joy, and he's trying to communicate a request. And the request here he's basically saying is, you know, let me have joy back from the Lord, which means let me have Onesimus back from you in the uh, Lord. Okay, did you understand that? What it really meant here? Yes, basically saying, let me have joy from you in the Lord. So the word joy basically means oninimi, the Greek word, which is the the name Onesimus. So basically what Paul is writing to say is if you look at, if you put Onesimus in the place of joy in this verse, he says, let me have Onesimus back from you in the Lord. So we see how 
you know, uh, Paul is not only a, just a great orator, but, you know, just a great writer, the way he uses words, uh, because he's so uh, a learned man, he knows Greek so well, and so he's using it, and he's saying, you know, if you send Onesimus back to me, it's like, you know, just receiving joy from uh, you in the uh, Lord, or is in the Lord. And he says, refresh my heart in the Lord. So, uh, you know, earlier in this letter, he says, uh, Paul tells Philemon that he was a man who refreshed the hearts of saints in verse 7. And now he's specifically telling Philemon that he would like to come and visit him uh, and he would like to stay with him and be refreshed even as he stays uh, in Philemon's uh, house. And he says that, you know, his he could also be refreshed, his Paul's heart could be refreshed when he um, takes back uh, Onesimus back to stay with uh, him and also allows Onesimus, you know, to come back and stay with Paul. Either of the way, you know, Paul's heart would be refreshed with much joy. Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience. So Paul summarizes his request and says, I write to you with confidence or I write to you because I have confidence in uh, you. So Paul's uh, letter is this letter that he writes to Philemon is basically full of appeal, also full of hope because he knows Philemon is a good man. He's not a harsh, rude or a bad man. And uh, Paul had every reason to expect that he, uh, Philemon, would uh, accomplish his Christian duty even more than what Paul asks of him or requires of him. And verse 22, he says, uh, you know, prepare uh, a room, a guest room for me because, you know, uh, uh, this shows Paul's close relationship that he shares with his uh, people that he mentors, his sons in the faith, people uh, who are his co-workers, co-laborers, and shows a close relationship between Paul and Philemon. And also Paul knew that uh, hospitality always awaited him at Philemon's home home and he wants to just go and be refreshed uh, knowing for uh, sure that he will be released from his Roman um, imprisonment and then he says I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you so Paul wanted Philemon to pray um, and uh, believe that you know through his prayers that that you know they would meet again they would be together uh, once again and that brings us to the end of uh, this um, letter to Philemon, verses 23 to 25. Before we move, uh, read 23, verses 23, 24, and 25. Anyone has any questions? Okay, I'll take the silence for a no, then can somebody read uh, verses 23 to 25, please? Can I read, Master? Sure, Divya. Okay, thank you. Uh, Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So Epaphras uh, is obviously known to the churches at uh, Colossae or in Colossae uh, because the, this was a place where he resided once, he lived once, and was also possibly even the place of his birth. And uh, he, he tells him that Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, uh, does not mean that he was also in prison, also in chains. Uh, it just could be a descriptive term for a believer or a Christian, uh, you know, fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, which means just like Paul is completely um, in obedience and surrender to the will of God, he knew that there were others also who, completely surrender themselves to the obedience to the will of God. And one of them was Epaphras. So here he says, Epaphras, in that sense, is a fellow believer, Christian, uh, you know, um, 
uh, a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, not in chains, but fellow prisoner, because he uses the uh, verse, uh, the phrase in Christ Jesus, it's reinforced uh, by in Christ Jesus. So Epaphras, uh, my fellow believer, sends you greetings, uh, yet it does not uh, you know, seem likely that Epaphras is actually Paul's uh, fellow prisoner, but under arrest with Paul, but just basically, you know, a fellow believer in Christ Jesus along with uh, Paul. Now here Paul also mentions Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. Uh, we know Mark is John Mark, who had joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and Paul didn't want to take him on the second missionary journey but later on sees the good work that um, you know John Mark does and then he finds him useful and wants him back and you know he's part of um, uh, Paul's uh, team so we see again something we learn about Paul he does not just write of people but uh, you know when he sees that he has been on the wrong he has made a wrong decision about somebody else how he corrects that and how he again co-works co-labors with them in the work of uh, Christ Aristarchus was one of uh, Paul's most faithful travel companions. Uh, Luke calls him a Macedonian from Thessalonica, and he's one of the two who was seized, uh, you know, by the mob uh, during the uproar at Ephesus. And uh, and we see that now also he is in Paul while Paul was in uh, prison. So most faithful travel companion of. Um, Paul. Uh, Demas, we studied Demas, we looked at Demas and, uh, you know, uh, his, uh, Paul writes about him in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, where Paul tells Timothy that Demas, uh, you know, he loved the world and because he loved the world, he has deserted Paul and has gone off to Thessalonica. So it, it's supposed to, it could be the same person that he's writing uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. Um, and now Demas was someone who continued his attachment with Paul till his last imprisonment at uh, Rome, but, uh, you know, somehow he just left him because, uh, you know, he loved the world more or he got into caught up in worldly desires and passions that he just left Paul and maybe even left the whole ministry and, uh, and what he was doing. Luke is um, basically talking about Dr. Luke who wrote uh, the book of Acts, uh, who joined Paul during his second missionary journey uh, when he boarded the ship uh, in Taurus and stayed with Paul till the end of his life. And uh, Paul calls him, uh, you know, as a dear friend, uh, Luke the doctor. And in 2 Timothy we read, uh, he says that only Luke is with me. So we see that Luke was very fond of Paul, maybe over there, good companions, good friends, was always with Paul and always also with Paul uh, during his last days, during his second uh, imprisonment. And then Paul ends this personal letter that he writes to Philemon, says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, be with your spirit. Uh, the CEB version says, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will be kind to you. Uh, another version says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul. And that's how he ends, uh, just speaks the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with uh, uh, Philemon, even as he makes a decision and even as he considers what to do with his runaway slave, Onesimus. So that is the end of Philemon. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then you have your um, third assessment on the book of Titus on the 19th, um, that is uh, this Wednesday. Uh, anyone else has any, uh, uh, I mean, we need to have the last assessment on Philemon, so you could suggest a date for that. Uh, before that, we will hear from Say. Yes, Say. Yes, Pastor, I was just going to ask a question that um, you mentioned they, um, we talked about Demas abandoning the world. So uh, this occurrence could have been before he abandoned Paul for the world, I, I guess. 
this letter to Freedom One, or was this after? Yeah, because he writes here, Demis, Luke, my fellow laborers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Because Paul um, goes to uh, Crete, uh, where he establishes a work, he leaves, uh, you know, Titus there, and then he goes to um, uh, um, Ephesus, where he leaves Timothy. But uh, here we see that, you know, he talks about him as a fellow laborer. So, yes, he is still, um, you know, along with Paul. But when he writes to um, Timothy, he says he has abandoned him. Yeah. And this letter is written while he was in, uh, in, in house arrest, right? But when he writes to Timothy, he is in a Roman imprisonment where death is impending upon him. So those are the last days. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Say. Yes. Uh, so when can we have our, uh, the last assessment on Philemon? Can you suggest a date, please? Because 19th is your uh, assessment on Titus. Could somebody please suggest a date because you have other assessments, so you all will know better when. Don't want to have an assessment. <laughs> Nobody suggesting a date, ma'am. Uh, is it like uh, two different assessments of Philemon mm -hmm. and Titus will be together? No, it'll be two different. Two different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So far, uh, yeah, whichever courses I am in. No one has given us the final assessments. The midterms, yeah, are done, but I have not uh, like been given final assessment. I'm doing a mix of courses, so mm -hmm. yeah. So okay, nineteenth is uh, Titus. So somebody suggesting uh, Christopher says April twenty sixth. So is everyone okay with April twenty sixth? Which means you have to submit your assessment on. Uh, 28th. Is that too close to the to the, the sun or could we make it 25th so you can submit it on 27th? Is that okay? 26th is too close to twin, the last date, 28th. So could we have 25th? You all can submit it on 27th, end of day. Is that okay? Yeah. okay. Yes. 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 Okay, so we'll have this on uh, on twenty fifth. That is five limit. Okay, I'll just make a note of it. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, uh, joining uh, this class. This is your uh, last class with me. Uh, Okay, so you have an assessment on 25th, but anyways, I mean, um, we don't want to keep it for the last day because it's very difficult for the e-learning students. Um, so we just keep it one day in a, uh, uh, on the 25th, which should be okay so that you can submit on 27th. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. It was a good uh, journey the last three years. and. Um, because I missed some semesters in, in between, but uh, um, thank you for being a vibrant, uh, lively, energetic class with all your questions. It was a good learning experience for us as well. Of course, you all kind of slow down in the, in the third year. Maybe you got all your answers in the first and second year, but being a wonderful class and uh, just wonderful teaching all of you, just wishing you uh, all God's very best and praying that even as you um, pursue your call and your purpose that you will continue to run your race with perseverance and endurance, fixing your eyes on Jesus. And uh, he who called you uh, was faithful. Uh, he will see you through and he will never leave you. So 
uh, just uh, praying that God would do great things and hearing from you soon all the great things that God is um, uh, doing in and through your life. So thank you so much for um, for your patient endurance the last three years and for being wonderful uh, students and for all the learning that we have received from you all. Thank you. God bless you all, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, Say. Thank you, Rupa, Avini, Mangi, Asha, Siddhant, uh, you, Elisha, Louis, Pratik. Yeah, Subhajit. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't miss any names. Yeah. Okay. God bless you all. Bye bye. Hope we get in touch. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I come to Seattle to uh, visit my sister, maybe you can uh, see you, Divya, in oh, person. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes. Bye. Bye.